Hey, it's so good to be here, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about a project that I have been um, kind of mulling over in my mind for quite a few years, and I finally have come up with a result that I'm happy to share with you tonight. I uh, shared this with Jay. He thought it was a great thing, so he thought it would be a great idea to present this to you, and if you are so inclined, you now have an idea that you can take and create. So what am I talking about? Well, I wanted a frame that I could take my images, have them hanging on the wall, and in three months down the road, if I decided I want to change maybe for the season, I could swap out the picture that I have for the summer and put in an autumn picture. Or after the season of autumn is over, I could take it out and I could put in a winter picture. Or maybe it's just that you have a picture hanging, it's been there for a while, and you want to trade it out for something that you've just recently taking, taken, and it's uh, uh, just very easy to put in place of one that you've had for a while. So what I did is I tried to come up with an idea of how to do this. And it took me several iterations to come up with the result that I'm going to share with you today. And I'm pretty satisfied with the way this works. So what I wanted was something that was easy and quick to do. I didn't want to go to the hassle of opening up a frame, taking out an image that was behind a mat, repositioning it, putting it, making sure the glass is clean, putting it all in there. I would never have done that on a seasonal basis like I just mentioned. I would not walk up in three months and say, okay, now I'm going to replace it with a fall print, and then I'm going to come back in two more months, and I'm going to put in my winter print. And, you know, I just wouldn't do it. I know I wouldn't do it because I haven't done it to this point, and I can do it easier probably than most people because custom framing has been my business. So I want it to be quicker and easier than that. I want it to look current with the styles that are out there today, I didn't want it to look like they had the ability to be changed. I just wanted it to look as though it was a permanent mount on the thing and then it just could have been changed easily without anybody knowing that there was the ability to do that. So I didn't want to see any of the mechanics of the thing. And I needed that cost to stay low. So my first project on this was to create a gallery wall in a room that I had. I had a big wall. I knew I wanted to put a gallery on there and it was going to be more than 10 images. I wanted many images on the thing and I wanted just to have the simplicity of a no frame look. Now I know that may or may not be to your style, but it works great and you can adapt it to have a frame on it. We're not going to talk about that one tonight because that's a little more involved than I have time for. I'd be happy to come back and give you a rundown on how to make a framed version of this, but that's not for tonight's conversation. So how did this kind of start? Or I've been looking for, I should maybe say, I've been looking for something to achieve this look and to get an idea maybe from somebody that had already invented the way to do it. And I was just not finding something that I could replicate. I did find exposure prints about, I don't know how long ago, five, six, seven years ago. They came out and I was getting ads on my computer all the time and I saw them and I was really interested in trying them. At the time, I just didn't have a photo that I was saying, oh, I want to spend whatever the cost was to have this put up on the wall, I just wasn't ready to commit, basically. But I did like the idea of how these exposure prints were made. And exposure, as you can see, is spelled a little bit different. That is the company name. And, um, but I did like it. And it was something that you could change. It did exactly what I wanted. It was a frame that had the ability to have the picture swapped in and out. And when you purchase it, you purchase the starter set, you get the frame and the print, and then after that you just had to buy a new print to put on it. So it did what I wanted it to do. The downside for me was that 
it didn't come small enough for me to do my 10 pictures or more collage. But I wanted to try one and I wanted to double check to see if I could replicate it. I didn't think I could. I still don't think I can, efficiently at least. But I ordered one in and it's, and I think they're quite lovely. I do like them. Um, Jay is, like I said, is going to show you these just a little bit more detail, tell you a little bit more about them in a few minutes. Um, I've got a couple of uh, websites where you can order them from. I, and since I have ordered them, I like them. Jay ordered them. He liked them. I'm telling you that it's a good quality. You don't have to stress about either one of these companies. You will get a nice product. And if you send them a nice file, you're going to get a nice product back. Um, I will tell you Exposer is coming from Europe. I didn't realize that when I ordered it, but it is. No big deal, except for it took just slightly longer to get here. Um, and Bay Photo is coming out of San Francisco. Anyway, I started with these, and um, I really like them. And so I don't have a photo of them here. Maybe I can get you a photo in the, in, in the uh, soon. Uh, Jay has the product right here with us. You can see it. And so let's see now what do I do? The smallest I can get that exposure print was 16 by 16. And I did order two 16 by 24s, which are great, but I don't have room for 10 16 by 24s. So I needed something smaller. It didn't come in something smaller. I needed something that would coordinate well and look good together with the exposure prints. How was I going to do the rest of the project? And I had also on Bay Photo, I was looking through their options because I don't live here anymore. So I don't have Camera Corner as a source. Um, an easy source, we'll put it that way. And so I was looking online for ordering and I had been looking at uh, Bay Photo. It's a very high quality lab. Anyway, they offered these two. One is a standout that I thought had potential to coordinate with my exposers. And then the other thought was they also were showing these float mounts for their metal prints. And the look of that one really is close to what my exposure print is. The question is, could I duplicate or replicate either one of these um, in a way that I could use them? And I knew that the standouts that I could, now those standouts look sort of like a little box. And on the top lid of the box, you've mounted your image. And so, that box though is made out of wood. It's not a solid box, as you will see when I show you uh, the inside framework of what we're doing. Uh, the metal float mount, or the, the metal image that has a float mount attached to it, if you can make out what this image looks like, it's a print mounted on metal, which we, are, we don't need the metal part of ours, won't be metal. I mean, it could be, but in my case, it isn't going to be. Um, and then they've used a metal frame, excuse me, they've used a metal frame to attach to the back of the print, and that's how they hang it. It's a great system. The, the metal frame is got a flat top, so it adheres nicely to the back of that print. However, a metal frame, which we could get and duplicate this exactly, it's a custom frame, so it's expensive. And it doesn't fit into my low cost scenario of my project. So do I need the metal print, or the, excuse me, the metal frame? No, I don't. I could duplicate that in wood, or I could replicate it in wood. And so that's what I thought. I have already replicated these standouts. And now I think with quite certainty that I could replicate this look of this float mount. So how am I going to hold my print to the frame? Because in these situations, these, this company has glued them down. They are attached permanently. So the wood 
piece that's holding or whatever piece that's holding the print flat to the frame in the standouts or on the metal thing, they have been glued in place permanently. Well, I didn't want it to be permanent. I wanted it to be interchangeable. So when I was looking at something else online, I stumbled on something and it was held on with magnets and I thought that would work. That would work if I could find the magnet. So I did a search, and sure enough, Amazon. You know, Amazon has everything. So Amazon had these purse magnets, they called them, um, or craft magnets, and they are little bitty button-shaped magnets that are in this little plastic sleeve. And they were inexpensive. I could get 32 pair for $13 when I ordered them. And... Um, that's enough, 32 pair, that's enough for four corners eight times. So I had eight frames worth of magnets. I needed more than that, but I thought, let me try this for the first run and make sure it works and that they, those magnets are strong enough to hold my images to the frame, which they were, no problem there. So I ordered these in, they came right away, and here is the collage that I created. So the two largest ones, the bear and the heron, those are the exposer prints. And all the rest of them are the ones that I made to go along with it. I think it works. Now, did I need to have two different types of frame, the flush mount and the float mount? No, I didn't, but I did. I don't need them. They could have all been floats or they could have all been flush mounts but I didn't do it that way. And, and really the reason I didn't was, as I make this presentation, I told you I found those two systems, which I did. I found the standouts and the metal float mounts. And I did find them, but I didn't find them in order. I thought I would do those standouts first. That's where I started. And then I got to thinking about it and I got to thinking, I could make these float mounts like those other ones I saw. And so I thought, I'm going to continue now with the float mounts. And so I have a variety of both styles. But I think in retrospect, I would have just done maybe all float mounts. They're much easier to produce because you don't have to have the exacting size of the print and the frame. Those have to match exactly. And with the float mount, they don't. So the float mount is much easier to produce. So therefore, I'm going to tell you how to do the flush mount, and then I will explain the difference for doing a float mount, and you can make your own decision if you choose to do these. So this is my uh, collage, and I'm quite happy with the gallery that it created. And here's a side view. So here I do have these two styles, and this is... These three along the back, there's a couple more here, here, and some out of frame, that are the standout style, the flush mount style. And then you'll see that this, this big one and this other large one over here, these are the exposers, and they have a float type system, so you can see you're not seeing what is holding it away from the wall. And the same for this one. This these four right here are float mounts. And so they really replicate the look of this exposer quite evenly. So from the front, you don't know immediately that they're not the same mounting system. So if I were to do it again, I think I would probably make them all float mounts, but that would be totally up to you. So before we go into how to create these frameworks, I bet I have a lot of people out there listening to me right now that are saying, I don't do woodworking. This is a waste of my time because I can't do it. Well, I don't think that that's true. If you like the idea of this, I'm going to explain to you how to actually make them. But if you don't have the ability to do the woodworking part of it, I've come up with a few ways that you can create them without having to use wood and saw. And these are the supplies you would need. You would need some sort of stretcher bar. So they make stretcher bar, excuse me, they sell stretcher bars 
by the piece or by the pair for you if you were to do a stretched canvas, say if you were an artist. So they sell the stretcher bars for art canvases. So you could buy those and they look very much like this particular piece. And here was another um, company's stretcher bar and their pictures. And I, I chose these because I thought it really shows how they go together. And then um, these are the canvas style. So they are about one and a half inches wide. And this particular one is three quarters of an inch from the wall, which is the depth that I used on my collage or gallery. And the way they fit together is they have this kind of end on them that is mitered. And then it kind of is like a finger that slides together. And then they hold that joint fairly tight. You can glue it up. They make wedges to hold in there to really snug them tight. And, um, but like I said, I would probably, if they were mine, I would throw some uh, wood glue on the corner of that, which you could buy even if you weren't a woodworker. And then, but like I said, they're about an inch and a half this way and three quarters of an inch deep. So three quarters of an inch deep here. Um, these are the stretcher bars for doing needlework, maybe needlepoint or something. You can see there's a frame made here. These are a nice quality wood generally. Um, you can see them in the package before you buy them and then you'll know. What I found that a lot of these art canvas ones, they're not going to show, so they will finger join a lot of the woods. So, you know, it would probably depend on whether you were buying one that had the finger joints on there if you got lucky and it was a clean piece to whether you would want to stain them. But I think if you were painting them, you would not notice those finger joints so much, so you could probably use either one. Um, usually I think the wood is a little bit nicer on these uh, needlework style. Um, and the needlework style generally are little squared ones, so it's three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. It will work great, so not a problem there. But what you do find is on the corners where mine will have like a miter cut, or maybe if you were sawing them, you would have a butt joint or a miter cut. These have a finger joint at the corner, which, you know, is, is fine. Just, you know, get it smooth and paint it. You're not going to see it much anyway, particularly if it's painted. Um, but that is, and if it's a float mount, you're not going to see it at all anyway, because it's hidden in behind. The other thing that I use wood for is to make these corner pieces, which you'll see coming up here. And again, I suggest you buy wood lattice pieces to uh, cut and use as this corner mount. But if you don't do the woodworking part, what could you use? Well, I think foam core would be a really good substitute. Is it as tough as the piece of wood? No, but it, you're not going to rough and tumble with this anyway. So I think if you use this foam core, you could uh, substitute it for the lattice piece. And you'll see down the road in my explanation where it is that I'm talking about. But I wanted you, so I don't lose you right at the beginning of this presentation, I wanted you to know that even if you're not a woodworker or you don't have a woodworker in your family of friends, then you can still achieve this project if you chose to. So for those not woodworkers, you know, besides this scenario, you could see if you have somebody down in your family list that would do it for you. A spouse, friends, family, neighbor, somebody that likes to do woodwork, that would be another option. So what do we need? Here's a supply list of the the things that we're going to need. And aside from the list that I just gave you for non-woodworkers, for the people that are actually going to do the woodworking behind it, let's talk about that for a minute. You will need a one by two type of wood. If you're going to paint them, pine is certainly adequate. It, you don't have to have any fancy wood. 
So pine will work if you're going to paint it. And for the most part, I spray paint it, but you could certainly brush paint it if you chose to with paint that you have left over from a room or a craft project or whatever it is. There are other woods available. Menards, I believe, has pine, and I always go for the choice cut pine, the stuff that doesn't have as much knot holes, it's not got as much ugliness to it. It's a prettier wood. You're paying a little bit more for it. It's still a pretty cheap project. Go for the higher quality pine. Or if you choose, you know you're going to stain it, or if you can't get pine because I just had a hard time getting some pine, I couldn't get it because of the supply chain issue that we're going through right now. Um, so I opted for a different type of wood. Like I said, Lowe's carries pine and oak, I believe. And then they have two different grades of pine. That's why I said choose the higher, the more premium type. Um, Menards has a lot of options. They have oak and maple and aspen and poplar and pine. I will say I don't like their pine as well. So if I'm not going to use, if I'm going to use pine, I go to Lowe's. If I'm not going to use pine, I go to Menards. And so anyway, you have that. So you'll need your one by twos. And then you need some sort of mount, mounting board for your print. Now I've got this on the list and in the next frame, I'm going to tell you, but if you don't have to mount them, don't do it yourself. So I'll get back to that in a minute. But if you're someone that's going to be mounting your prints yourself, you need a hard board, like it's a wood, a masonite, or you could use foam core, particularly on small ones. Uh, foam core and a big print don't really go very well together because they tend to want a bow. But for an 8x10, 11x14, it works great. It's lightweight. Um, it's easily accessible. And it's easy to cut. If you're going to cut it, make sure you have a brand new blade on your utility knife and a straight edge. And you, if it starts to catch, you need to start over. Your blade is not sharp enough. Um, we need a quarter inch thick type of board, which I suggest lattice. It comes one and a half wide by a quarter of an inch thick. And it works great. Again, I mentioned you could use foam core. So that's an option. You'll need wood glue, magnets, a way to cut your wood, your one by twos and your lattice. So if you're going to do miter cuts, you need a miter cut saw of some sort. And if you're going to do a butt joint, then you obviously don't need the miter cut. You can just do a straight cut with your hand saw or your electric saw. You'll need some way to hold them together. So we need a corner vise or a corner clamp of some sort. And I would venture to guess that most people that are in this room don't have either one of those at their disposal at home. And I'm not suggesting that you go and you buy um, clamps just for this one project because I said it works great. But they do work better than my alternative. But... The alternative that I've come up with for this is just using tape to hold your corners together. So my preferred way would be to cut a miter on it, but you don't have to. And like I said, if it's a float mount, you're not even going to see the ends. Um, so you could certainly just build some very easy butt jointed frame and hold it together with painter's tape until the glue dries. And I will show you that in a sh short while. Um, we need some hot glue or some other type of glue to glue on our magnets. Uh, you'll need a sawtooth hanger to hang your frames from or a wire system if you prefer. Bump pads, I always put bump pads on the bottoms of my frames so they don't mar my walls. And if you're going to nail your corners, which is ideal. I mean, ideally I would like the corners of every frame to have a nail in it. It's just a stronger corner. But these particular frames, particularly if you're doing smaller images, they really are not carrying any weight such as glass. You know, in a frame that we put glass in, that's a lot of weight on those joints. And so then it's you would really want to have those nailed because they're just not strong enough to hold the weight of the glass. But in this scenario, it's not an issue. So 
Yeah, it'd be nice if you could nail them, but if you choose not to, I think you're going to be all right. But here are the supplies you would need if you're going to nail your corners. Now making the frame. This is again, I'm going to go over how to put together a flush mount frame, which flush mount, if I, if it's not clear to you what that means, the frame and the print are the same size. So that frame is flush to the edge of the print. It's, it's the same size. Yeah. So how do you get started? Well, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get your print. So if you're the person that's printing the image at home, then you need to get that printed in whatever size you were wanting. If you're going to order it from a lab, this is what I was saying. You won't need to mount them yourself. Just order it mounted. So you're going to go to your lab. You're going to say, I want this print printed this size and I want it mounted. And a lot of the labs will have different options for you to choose for how you want it mounted. What materials do you want it mounted on? And so you just need something sturdy. You need it to be flat and stay flat. And so you can make your choice as to the materials that you want, the thickness that they come in, and possibly there may be some options for color choice, maybe black versus white. I don't know what you'll have to pick from at whatever lab you go to, but know that usually that is an option and definitely take advantage of that option. Yes, it costs a little bit more to have your print mounted, but it's going to cost you at home too. So you're going to have to buy the adhesive. You're going to have to buy the board it mounts on. You're going to have to mess with mounting it and getting it do done correctly. And then you may have to adjust the size or deal with it putting it down square or did you get bubbles in it. So by all means, if your lab offers to mount prints, take that advantage and use it. Then, once you have your mounted print, now you need to measure it. Did you order an 8x10? Okay, but is it really 8x10? That's the question. Is it supposed to be 8x10? Yes, but is it really? And that's what you want to double check on. So measure all areas, you know, both sideways and up and down. Is it 8x10 or is it seven and seven eighths or seven and three quarters by nine and three quarters. You want to know that because you need to know for a flush mount just exactly the size of your print. And then you're going to cut your one by twos appropriately. Now I have that you can at this point stain them or paint them. And I do think it's a good idea to do it at this point. You don't have to paint it at this point if you don't want to. But if you are going to stain the wood, and it's going to be visible, such as on a flush mount. If you stain it after you do the glue up and you got any glue out on that wood, then the stain isn't going to take as well as it would if you had done it prior. So do your staining before the glue up. That way you don't have to worry about the glue getting on the surface of the frame and now the stain isn't being accepted by the wood equally. So you got this splotchy corner going on. If you stain it first, you don't have to worry. The glue won't affect it. It won't make any difference. So go ahead and stain first. Painting you can do either first or later, whatever's easier for you. Then you're going to assemble your frame using either your corner clamps or tape. And we'll go into that in a minute. And then if you are nailing the corners, that's when you would do that. So what we want to do is cut those pieces. So if you're mounting your own uh, image, now you need to cut the board that it's going to be mounted on. If it's hardboard or if it's foam core, you need to cut it now. If you're getting your print, again, I'm going to repeat myself, but you're going to order from a lab such as the local camera corner or whether you order online, you're going to order it in mounted and then you don't have to worry about it. So you would cut your one by twos exactly to the size of the mounted piece and you need four. So you need two for each side. So two 
eights by in two tens, if that was the case. And it's an outside measurement. So it's not the inside of the frame or the inner bevel area. It's the outer edge that you will be measuring to the eight by 10 dimension, if that's the dimension of your picture. And then you'll also need four of these lattice pieces cut. And if you look at it, it's just sort of like a corner piece. It's a 90 degree angle out here. And then um, we're concerned about these two side pieces. Those are about an inch, in, probably an inch and a half. And um, that's what we're going to use to mount the magnets on, as you can see. So if you're mounting your own prints, and, and I kind of, I'm briefing over this because I have a feeling that the majority of you are not printing at home. And for those that are, I think this will make sense to you. But if you're going to mount your own image on a board, whether it's a piece of wood like this hardboard, or if it's a piece of foam core, and you want the mounting board to match the side of the frame because it does show. So if your frame is going to be black, then you would want the edge of your mounting board to be black if at all possible. Now, if it's like this one, it's gray, I wanted the edge of my mounting board to be gray. So what I've done is I had some gray craft paint, that dollar, dollar fifty little jar of craft paint. And I simply painted the edge and then I came over to the face of the mounting board just a little bit, just, just to be cautious to make sure that everything was covered that might possibly show. The thing that I want to emphasize here is that you want to make sure that you paint these edges before you mount your picture. You don't want to wait and then think, oh, I should have painted it because now it's a pain to get it without getting paint on your picture itself. So paint them before. Also, please realize that if you're going to buy foam core for this purpose, you can get foam core in white or in black. So if black is a better fit for you, then get black foam core to mount on. Um, you can also paint the foam core. I don't think I would try painting it with spray paint. I think it might eat away the foam in the middle, but you could test it and find out. Um, but latex or craft acrylics, those will work fine. Now we're going to assemble the, the frame. And I have corner vices because I am a picture framer by trade. So I have corner vices available to me. And if you were doing that, you just need two sets of corner vices and or corner clamps even would work the same way. And you'd put together L's and then you would take those L's and do the opposite Corner, the two loose corners after that. Um, I figure the majority of people, if not everybody in here, do not own corner clamps or corner vices. So I've come up with a way that you can assemble your frames without having this piece of equipment. I think it will work pretty well for you. Um, the one thing you need to be aware of is if you're going to do it for a flush mount that squareness matters and so you may need some way to check to see if it's square whether it's butting it up to a corner that you may have on a kitchen cabinet or um, some something that you know is a true 90 degree corner not all corner walls are actually 90 degrees so I wouldn't go to that but you know that you I'm sure there's something around your house that you could find that you could use to kind of be sure, assured that it's a 90 degrees. Anyway, what we're going to do, I'm going to play this little video for you, and I actually talk in it. And so you can hear what I'm saying. I won't over talk it. I may tell you some details after it's done. I apologize for any poor video quality. I am here to tell you that there probably is several things in here that you think, oh, she should have done a better job, and I agree. But this is what I have to show you, and it gets the, the idea across. Okay, so let's go through this. I have my four pieces. These are just scraps that I had laying around. So, But whatever your four pieces is, you would put them on a flat surface, get everything laid out so the corners were all aligned the way they should be. And then I put tape on the corner of each corner. So 
you can see there's tape here and here and here and here and these wrap all the way around so I've lined them up got my corners matched up nice and pretty and then this one has tape on it but it's only on the one side so at this point I would open it back up or set it on the edge and if you open it it'll open sort of like a book so you lay it out and it's kind of long for my my uh, video here so at this point I would take glue my wood glue and only on each side I would run a bead of wood glue, glue here 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 and then I guess down here so that would be glue for each four of the corners once I have glue on them you'll see it's still connected there I'll roll it up and lay it on a nice flat surface if it gets glue on it you can clean it up mine I would have a piece of cardboard under but anyway I would get those all snugged back up so they looked good and when this everything looks good I would take this final corner and wrap that piece of tape around there so that now I have four corners that are held together and I might even take another piece of glue or excuse me hey sorry for that bad video one hand and I would just put it across here making sure everything's lined up and then snug it down and then let just let it sit there and dry and I don't know how long it'll take your glue to dry. Mine's fast drying, so it only takes 15 minutes, but yours may take more like a half hour or something. But I would do that for each corner. Generally speaking, I would nail it. But in this situation, you could try to nail it, except for chances are great, it's going to move apart, so you're just going to have frustration. Um, you might wait till the glue dries and then try to nail it, but I just don't think you need nails probably in this situation due to the fact that it's not going to have any weight on it at all. But if you choose to do that, um, one nail probably in each corner would be ample. So there you go. So now that you've seen that play, um, I thought it did a pretty, I did a pretty good job of explaining how you do it. So just to maybe, um, iterate a few of the other ideas is I would make sure that when you feel those joints, those miter joints in this case, um, that they're smooth so that it's a nice smooth fit. And if you notice as I kind of squeeze that one in together, they did come together a little bit more. So maybe I could have put another strap of tape on the right end over here where I could have brought it from here to here and here to here when I had, you know, two hands to do it will be much easier than I was holding my phone to video the thing and trying to do it all one handed. That was a little bit of a challenge to remember to keep everything in the frame and to try to keep it uh, steady instead of bouncy. But I did the best I could. I think you get the point. Um, of how to do that and so it's ready to go and so this would be for a real long uh, kind of a panoramic style frame or image okay whoops okay so if you're doing that taping method and you're doing it for a flush mount that was kind of probably going to be used for a float mount but if it were going to be used for a flush mount I would want to make sure before that glue had a chance to dry, that it was kind of square. I mean, it looked square, but that doesn't mean that it was. And what do I mean? It means that those 90 degree angles were at the corners. And were they really? I don't know. I didn't check them. But you might want to check if you're going to use it as a flush mount by putting your board that's going to have your print on it, whether it's mounted or not, it doesn't matter, Set that board on top of the frame that you just glued up and make sure everything lines up on the edges because you have a little bit of play before that glue dries. And so if you, you know, before you strap it down with all those extra pieces of tape, you might make sure that it's lined up the way that it needs to be to fit flush to the edges of that mounting board. 
and do that again before that glue starts to dry. And then once you are good with the results, then just let it sit there and dry. Um, might be just several hours you would let it dry or maybe overnight just quit for the day and then at this point you're ready to finish it off so if you haven't painted it paint it now if you haven't put varnish on it and you're going to varnish it because you use stain then do that now and if you wanted to drill holes if you're going to nail it up and like i said i don't think you have to for this scenario but be aware that if you drop it on a corner it's probably going to break but um it, I, again, I think you will probably be all right without nailing it. If you choose to nail it, which would be my preference, if at all possible, is I always pre-drill. You can do one or two nails at each corner, at least one. These are small, lightweight. So, and then you will use a little um, finish nail to pound in there. Now, this particular photo that you're looking at, it's a one by two frame. A piece of wood making this frame but in this instance it's only a half inch from the outside to the inside and then it's the one and a half inches deep when I make mine for my collage I make the two and a half like lay parallel to the the surface so to the table that I'm working on to the wall it's the one and a half inch wide or the two inch side you know, wood is, comes in sizes. They're one by twos, but really it's three quarter by one and a half. Um, so it would have been three quarters of an inch off of the table in this case, which means that the drill is going and the nail are going through an inch and a half depth. So you will need to have a longer nail, like say somewhere between Probably, I don't know if they even make one and three quarter inch nails, but they do make two inch nails. So you probably have to have a two inch nail to get in there. Anyway, nail it if you want, then you'll have to fill the nail holes. If you're the one that's going to be mounting your own print, I have a few tips. I've been doing this for 40 years, a long time. And so I have a few tips to share with you on how to do a good mount job. So let's talk about it. I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. I've written it down. You should be able to come back and reference this. So what you do is you put your print face down towards the table. You put your mounting board face up from the table. So the surface you're going to mount on is up, and the surface you're going to spray adhesive is up on the print. And now we need to clean those surfaces because there's probably dust on them. The paper that the print was printed on probably had dust on it so that the pieces of paper didn't stick together in the box. We need to get rid of that. You may have accumulated dust just from sitting around. Uh, your board may have had dust on it. If it was wood and you cut it with, and it's got sawdust on it, we need to make sure that's off of there. Even though you dusted it and wiped it off, we want to make sure one final time that that dust is removed from both surfaces because if it is not and it has a little bit of a grain to it, you will get this real pretty little pimple underneath your picture and you'll be able to see it. Um, so what we do is we lay those down like I just told you. You're going to take and the best tool I have found over those 40 years is the back of your hand. You're going to wipe it on your clothes, your shirt or your jeep pants, whatever it is, and you're going to wipe the edge clean on your hand and you're going to drag it across the print. You're going to clean your hand and swipe down the next pass. Clean your hand, wipe over the, until you get the back of that print completely done. And then you're going to come over and you're going to do the same thing for the mounting board. And I truly do this and it truly works well. So now that you're clean, you're ready to go out and spray your adhesive the back of your print. I only do the back of the print. I have a box lid, a large box lid that I have had. You could take a large box, cut off the top, just have about a two, uh, four inch deep uh, side piece on it. I take it outside. I put a piece of clean, I use craft paper, brown paper, um, in the bottom of it, but you put a sheet of paper on the bottom of it, and we're gonna put the face down of your print into this box. 
I do it outside. I don't want to overspray in the house. I have to be very hard pressed in the middle of the winter to do it inside. I wait for a day that's decent to do it outside if at all possible. You're only out there for a matter of a minute or so. And so I will do it outside if possible. If it's super cold, obviously I don't. But um, most of the time outside, I don't want that mess in my house. Spray it. You're going to spray horizontally. You're going to spray vertically. And you're going to spray diagonally. Yes, I mean three passes, not just one or the other or the other. No, you're going to do all three. So you're going to vertically... Then you're going to spray it horizontally. Then you're going to spray it diagonally. So you have three coats of spray adhesive over it. Light coats the whole time. So shake it like the directions tell you. Spray the light coat on the back. You're going to bring it in once it's coated. And then worry about picking up your mess here in a few minutes. But you're going to mount it right away. As soon as it's tacky, read the directions on the can. I feel that uh, photo mount... Spray is a good spray. I've used it for years. It's available at Michael's, possibly Hobby Lobby. You're going to hold it on the top edge, and you're going to line up your bottom edges first, kind of tack it down, and then hold it up at the top. And then you're going to start using your hand to push it down as you go, letting out all the, as much air as you can press out as you go. You don't have to seat it really good. You're just this is a quick once over to get it down. Once it's in place, we're going to take and cover it with a clean piece of paper. So we're going to cover the top of your picture. We're going to protect that face and with clean paper. And then you're going to, from the center, radiate out with a squeegee type motion. Use a credit card or a brand new smooth as can be spatula. No rough edges at all. So uh, whatever you use, it needs to be smooth. It could be a piece of cardboard that's cut, you know, about... A four inch wide piece and you're going to hold it at an angle and you're going to press as you move across I think a credit card would be better than a piece of cardboard I don't think it's strong enough to hold up to the pressure and you're going to give it several passes horizontally vertically diagonally make sure your edges are all done what you're doing is really seating that print into the glue and onto the mounting board you're getting a nice firm adhesion. What I will tell you is if you get a kink in a photograph or any material, you can still mount it. It will never go away. Kinks cannot be taken out after the fact. It's there. You did it. It's going to show. But you can still use it and it will still glue down. It just will always be visible. Oops, wrong way. If you need to trim it afterwards, turn it upside down on a cutting board and trim away the edges with a super sharp utility knife. Get a brand new blade for this project. You'll be sorry if you didn't. Okay, let's talk about adding magnets. Let's get on with this show. Um, so the way that I add magnets is I turn my print upside down. My mounted print is upside down on my table. Uh, I will lay the frame over top that mounting board and up in the corner is where I'm going to glue my magnets. Please realize that magnets have two sides. So you've got two magnets for each corner. They need to attract each other, not repel. So there's one way they'll go together to attract and then the other way is going to repel. If you glue the wrong side of the magnet up or down, whichever the case may be, then you may not be able, your magnets may not work. So you need to be aware of this before you adhere them to the surfaces. How do they need to go together? Um, you do not remove the sleeve either. You leave the sleeve on because the glue will hold the plastic better than it will adhere to the, the metal. So you'll see a big picture of the magnets. This is what they look like. One side is gold of mine and one side is silver. I know that the gold silver side, they, they need to go together. Gold needs to touch silver to attract. Double check yours to see if it's the same. If I do silver to silver, it doesn't work. It repels. You can't get them to stick. If you do gold to gold, it won't stick. So it has to be gold to silver to stick. So that means I need, if I have the silver side up, 
on my mounting board, then I need to have the gold side down towards the new magnet when I put it on that little corner piece. So if I see silver, like in this picture, they're both silver, they're not going to work. That's going to repel each other. I need to, before I adhere that one up to the corner, I need to turn it upside down so that the gold side is showing and then this silver side is up on this piece of wood and then they will work. Double check yours to make sure that's true. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to put a magnet in each corner. I'm going to glue it in place. I'm going to make sure I've got the right side up. I'm going to then glue a magnet up into the corner of each one of these little corner braces. And I'm going to adhere it. I'm going to click it on top of that magnet. It's going to suck right down and chances are it's not going to be tight to the frame. So I'm going to have to push it towards the frame. Make sure your outside frame and the outside of the mounting board are still lined up. Make sure you stung that up into the corner and then I'm simply going to run a bead of glue after that's nice and straight in there. Glue here and here. And it, when it dries, it's cool, it dries, it's ready to go, it's done. And so if you've done that to all four corners, it's finished. All you have to do is add your sawtooth hanger and your bump pads. Now I turned one over so you can see the back side here. And you can see that bead of glue here. You can't see this side because of the angle, but it's glued on both sides. Here's the bump on that I've put on. I haven't filled my nail hole yet. Um, but I did. And then there's a sawtooth hanger up here. Now I decided to go ahead and open it up. So I removed the picture from the frame and here you can see the back of the print with the four magnets. And this is the front of the frame with the four magnets. Now why did I have to go to the hassle of mounting the magnet on this piece of wood and back there instead of just popping it up here on the frame where it'd be much easier to do? Well, because I want this to sit tight on the side. I want that mounting board to just blend right into the side of the frame. And because of the thickness of the magnets, you can't set them on top of that wood or there would be a gap of about a quarter of an inch. The, the two magnets together plus the two plastics are probably at least a quarter of an inch. And I don't want to see them, number one, because they're not attractive to see from the side. And so, and I also wanted it to be cinched up to the, to the frame. So that's what it looks like on the inside. And then all I would have to do is either put it back on, if I choose to rehang it as it was, or bring in another picture that's been mounted. And then I would just need to figure out how far in to place my new magnet on my new piece of new print. So I will have to have some magnets on hand for the next set of prints that I want to to put on these. And I will just check. It's like, okay, if I measure over here, that's an inch and a half and an inch and a half down that I know that my plastic sleeve needs to be maybe just a slight bit farther over than an inch and a half so that I don't catch it in the, in the air. Uh, when I, you know, when I put it down, it's not too in the way where it would catch on the wood frame. So I told you that they essentially are the same, flush mounts and float mounts. The only difference between the two is on a flush mount, the mount, the frame that you're mounting on is smaller than the print area. So it's easier because I don't have to worry about my print, mounted print being exactly the same size of the frame. It just has to be smaller. So if you were doing an 8 by 10 frame, excuse me, an 8 by 10 print, then maybe you would want to have your stretcher bars be an, anywhere from an inch to two inches smaller. So that's for each edge. So if it's an 8 by 10 and I wanted to come in an inch on each edge, well, that's an inch on the left and an inch on the right. That's two inches. I need to subtract two inches from the eight and two inches from the ten. So I would want to buy uh, stretcher bars or make my stretch or my frame 
six by eight. If I wanted to come in farther than that, then I would size it accordingly. Maybe you want to come in an inch and a half. So an inch and a half on the left, inch and a half on the right, that's three inches total. Subtract that from the overall of eight. And now we're at uh, three from eight is five. And if it were 10 and I did the same thing, I would subtract three from 10 and I'd have seven. So I would be ordering, what did I say, a five by seven. And that's how you will arrive at the size of bars or wood pieces that you need. And then the rest of the process is exactly the same. So that's what I have for you the, tonight about doing these magnetic systems. I have examples up here for you to come up and see. So why don't you come on up and, and, and give it a look and ask any questions that you want. And I hope it, you found this interesting. Thanks again.